My name is Tracy Ulansky, and I am with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Bellevue University is a sponsor of the Nebraska Vietnam Veteran Memorial Foundation. I'm here with the at the 38th Annual Vietnam Veteran Reunion with Army Veteran Robert P. Cross, who has agreed to share his story for the History Project and the Nebraska Vietnam Veteran Memorial Foundation. So Robert, let's begin with your full name and where you were born. Okay, Robert P. Cross. Born in Grant, Nebraska. You need the middle name or is the initial good enough? That's fine. Okay. So tell me about your family and where you grew up. I grew up on my parents' small ranch in Arthur County, Nebraska. And I was the youngest of six kids. family, okay. Huh. Everybody was supposed to go to Kearney State College and become a teacher. But uh, my middle brother went to Kearney for three and a half years and he stayed out a semester to work and make some extra money and got drafted in 68. So he came home three months early in June of uh, 70, about two weeks before I got my draft lottery number, which was 74. <laughs> I thought, well, okay, here I go. No, I'm not going to college. I'm going to go to the military and get it over with and use the GI Bill. Were you still in high school when you got the number? No, I graduated in May and I got, they, they did the lottery the 1st of July. So, and I was 18 in October. So, that's, that's 69 actually. Where did you do your basic training? Uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. I went in, I think it was the 6th of April, 1971. There was two guys that got on the bus. We went. I, I went to Ogallala, got on the Greyhound bus, and a guy got on there with me. I recognized him. He was from Llewellyn, Nebraska, you know, from playing sports and stuff. He was a grade ahead of me, but actually his birthday was only, mine was the 19th October and his was the 13th, but the 15 was the cutoff for the age to go to school. So, anyhow, Another guy got on a lodge pole, and they, the three of us got to visiting in the bus, and one said, well, he had a buddy that had to go to Vietnam, and he says he was an MP, so if, if he had to go to Vietnam, he wanted to be an MP. I said, fat chance of that happening. Six people out of basic training went to Fort Gordon, Georgia for MPAIT, and all three of us were in that group of six. That's, I don't mean, you know, what's, what's the odds? Anything special happen in basic training with those two? Uh, I do remember this about Terry from Llewellyn. He was a stocky built guy, and there was this short little drill instructor. We were doing the, I think they were called Poogle Sticks. They looked like gigantic Q-tips, and you'd put a football helmet on, way too big, one size fits all, I guess, and you'd line up facing each other, and you would, it was like bayonet training, kind of, you would. <coughs> well, this drill sergeant says, nobody's ever, no trainees ever beat me in this. Next guy up, well, the next guy up was Terry, and I'm about two guys behind him in line. And Terry goes this way, that way, next thing I'll boom! That guy goes rolling and his smoky bear hat falls off. And he goes, that guy gets up, puts that smoky bear on hat, gets it squared away and walks off. Never said a word. I've been, way to go, Terry! <laughs> <laughs> Any other 
but uh, and something happened when we did our final PT test because I was a kind of a mediocre distance runner in high school. We had to run a mile on a quarter mile sand track. I guess I always like to run. I'm just smoking around there. Well, my brother Harry, when I went in, I says, what's some advice you could give me? He says, don't be too gung-ho. Don't be a screw-up. Don't volunteer for nothing. So I'm smoking around here and I got about a half a lap to go and this young lieutenant runs up on my left side and I see that lieutenant bar and he says, keep this pace up and you'll sign a new company record. And I'm thinking, I don't want to do that. So I slowed her down. Finally this little guy from Wyoming passed me. It's still running in five minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> it's like, I should have been running a mile in high school instead of the half mile. <laughs> anyway, so then we went to AIT in Georgia, Fort Gordon, Georgia, and I never knew these other two guys that are here with me today because they were in B Company and I was in A Company. What was your first uh, assignment and your first job? Well, see that was just military police training. We were an MP? Well, we were training to be MPs. So, uh, there was some classes on military law, you know, because you have to learn how to arrest somebody and do it properly, and it's a lot like civilian, you know. Of course, cram courses, you just take this little bit, you get enough knowledge to just be dangerous is all. <laughs> Had to learn how to shoot the 45, you know, the 1911 45 pistol, which I never did get good at. <laughs> Some guy asked me once, how, how good are you with that pistol? And I said, if I could take it out and throw it at you and hit you, I could shoot you. <laughs> so they kept telling us. Don't worry about Vietnam because that, that war's winding down. None of you will go there. 85% of the trainees from that company went to Vietnam. <laughs> so, uh, were you, we got. Were you one of them? Huh? Were you one of them? Yes. What did you do over there? Well, what was your company? What, uh, I was in the 483rd. MP Platoon, 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile. We were based out of Benoit, Republic of Vietnam. Which she would call South Vietnam, but that, it was actually the Republic of Vietnam. Uh, and my cousin, older cousin, went to school with my brother that graduated in 65. She married a guy that, as soon as he graduated college, they drafted him. He went to Vietnam as an MP, and as soon as he got there, he told him he got a degree in college, and I can type this many words per minute. He spent the whole time at Long Ben at an office job. So, Two days before I was to ship out, they had a welcome home for him in the little park there in Arthur. So I asked him, uh, he says, well, being an MP, you'll be pretty safe. He says, let's, let's, the only thing he ever saw happen was guys on convoy escorts, so stay away from that. Okay, so we get there and we do this little, oh, what did they nickname for it? Anyway, it was an orientation for Vietnam. A couple of days just spent in this little, they had four acres of jungle right in the middle of this big Benoit Army base and we went out to train, you know, cram course. 
this is the way things are in Vietnam, whatever. Uh, and in the morning they told us, all you guys get on this deuce and a half or whatever, so we loaded up. And the guys A through G, of course, went to Benoit. The other guys went north and different places. So these guys that are here with me were in that group of A through G, last names. Got to the MP company and got off the truck. Didn't even get my duffel bag unpacked, got a cot set up. Guy walked in the door and said, need two volunteers, you and you. We went down to the arms room and <coughs> checked out an M60 and M16 and like that. Uh, said, what are we doing? Well, we're gonna go out on a convoy escort. <laughs> well, coming back from the fire base, the, commander who was a staff sergeant, E6, second tour there. He had me drive, but he'd already got me kind of psyched in it because we went up the road and we went through this, oh, I wouldn't know if you call it a city, but it was, you know, a town. And there was this old papasan on this little bike. I'd never seen a motorcycle with bicycle pedals. <laughs> but he's going along like this right in the middle of the road. Well that sergeant swerves over there like that and comes up there on him and yells at him. The guy yells at him in Vietnamese. And he just pulls away like that, comes back and takes his leg and kicks the side of his bike and went flat on the road and the guy went rolling like a bag of laundry and and I'm behind him, you know, with the M60 that was on the swivel, you know, because I was a machine gunner. And I'm thinking, what the heck? So when we get to the fire base, I said, what was that about? He says, don't stop your convoy for nothing. Move them over, run them over. So anyway, on the way back, he had me drive. He says, watch in your rear view mirror. If the trucks are stringing out, slow up. If they're bunching up, speed up. Basically drive as fast as the slowest vehicle. So it must, couldn't have been a week or two later and they assigned me permanently to convoy escort. So I drove the lead gun jeep for a couple months. Did you ever have to see action going with that? Uh, we, that, that sergeant went home, we got another one, and he was a total opposite. He said the maximum speed on convoy is 35 miles an hour when you go through the cities, 10 mile an hour. If anybody in your road, you stop. Well, I'm in this mode the other guy taught me. So I'm like this thoroughbred that's being held back, and it's just like this guy's driving me nuts. Then, we're not in the middle of all that, we get this guy that joined it, or they put him on the convoys, and he was a specialist for his class, and I was only PFC, so he outranked me, so he wanted to drive. So I moved back to Gunner, because we were shorthanded. See, the sergeant used to just ride along with me, and we didn't even have a Gunner. I was a driver. So while he was driving, he, he says, I'm tired of missing breakfast every morning. I'm going down to breakfast. You're going along. And I was thinking, yeah, it ranks me. What do I care? So we went to breakfast. Well, the, the sergeant came down there and got us. And, well, he was so mad. Of course, he had a stuttering problem. He was so mad he could only stutter. Well, to show that guy, he had me drive. Well, we were 30 minutes late, at least, leaving. We got out there, oh, I think it was past Swan, Zon Lock, which was the province capital where we were headed for that fire base and uh, heard on the radio that this Arvin convoy had been ambushed. 
and the medevac was on its way and this and that and whatever. And I said, that's just up the road here. And he said, no, that's way up north. I said, no, these radios only carry 20 miles. So we came up on it and it was quite a mess. And there was just kind of like a, a, like a movie scene or something. There's people laying around and, and they had their families with them. There was one with a white shirt laying over the back of this truck, you know, didn't have the top up and red all over. Well, I just kind of went like this through all the vehicles and kept on going. That guy was mad because he wanted to stop. Well, he'd shown me his pictures from his previous tour that he'd taken of all these war dead, which you weren't supposed to do. So I, I says, I, I wasn't gonna stop. He said, well, you stop. I said, what do you wanna do? Get some more pictures of dead people. <laughs> but when we get there, the other guy and I, we both agreed if we would have been on time, we would have been in the ambush instead of those orphans. So then I had started having these nightmares about being attacked. I'd wake up in a panic and so not long after that, this sergeant come in to wake me up at 5 a.m. and he'd shaken me and I don't know what I did. And the guy there said that I attacked him. But I get out there to the convoys, you know, where we're getting set up. He says, you know, I know what the hell's the matter with you? And I says, well, I don't know why? He says, well, you, you, whatever. Anyhow, they took me off a of convoy escort and <laughs> Best thing he ever did, sent me to Firebase Mace, which was usually our destination on the convoys. So I spent three months there, and these two guys were there with me. And that was a total different deal. There wasn't a lot of brass there, which was good for me, because I didn't wasn't too much in that military discipline stuff. <laughs> what was your job there? Well, we had a day shift and a night shift. We worked from like seven to seven. We had two guys that would be up at night and we rotated so nobody would be stuck on the night. And the night was pretty much boring unless there was some attack. We might have to go out and be on the bunker line to help out or something, but usually it'll just, just sit around in case something happened, you know. But one of the problems is Sammy and I tried pretty hard on it, stopped the flow of drugs. Because there was a lot of skag use which would nickname for heroin. The civilians would sell that stuff to them just I mean it was just kind of out of control. And we, we finally come up with the idea that rather than take these civilians to the province capital and turn them over to the authorities there with the contraband because they would literally beat us back to the base just like they're laughing at us all the way so we decided we'll just throw them in the, what the, those people called the monkey house or, or makeshift jail for a couple of days and kick them out and the contraband we'd just burn it put it in the you know barrel and burn it Get how often did that happen just, kind of an ongoing thing. A regular basis? Yeah. So Would they put uh, the GIs in the monkey house as well? Or was oh, it once, once in a great while. Uh, most of the time it was just the just, uh, civilians. Kind of, kind of ironic. This when I first got there, this I, th I thought, oh, this poor little guy, you know, 
he was driving this small motorcycle behind this old taxi-like thing. It was like a little truck with a kind of a top over, just loaded with people. He's right on their tail, and I come up behind him. I'm going to get a picture of my little Instamatic camera. And he turned around and saw me and got all spooked and crashed his bike and I almost hit him. And I thought, and he had all this skin road rash, so I loaded him up in the Jeep. And MP at the gate says, you, you can't take him on the base. I said, I'm going to take him up to the med station and have him fix him up. And, uh, that wasn't a thing to do because the sergeant came over and chewed my butt out. I was like, I'd killed 10 people or something, you know. Well, come to find out, he was one of the biggest drug runners in the whole area. That's how come you could afford a motorcycle. <laughs> So this Sammy that's out here with me now, one night we had these that kid and two or three other people in the lockup and it was I think like an eight by eight foot connex, you know, like, like these containers that you see, only it's and they took where the slits were and, and cut grooves with you know notches with a torch. So it had ventilation, and it was right up against the back of our MP station, which was just a over, above ground bunker. And then they had an area on the inside that just had like hail screen on there, so they could be there or there. Well, they complained that it was too hot, and this guy from Chicago, this his last name was Floyd, he was supposed to be kind of minding the store, so to speak. Well, he just kicked back and went to sleep. But before that, the people said, we're too hot, can we get out here? Well, they pried that wire loose and got out and all got away. So the next morning, I go outside and I said, well, that kid didn't take his motorcycle with him. Well, if he'd have fired it up, you know, everybody woke up. So the sergeant says, he says, Cross, you and Sammy, you, you uh, after breakfast, you, go into the jeep trailer and you haul that motorcycle down outside the front gate and dump it out. Uh, I don't know what went over, come over Sammy, but it sounded like a good idea to me too. He says, let's fix this dang thing so he'll never ride it again. So we put dirt in the gas tank and in the oil and <laughs> the next thing I know, Sammy's got the got into the seat of the Jeep and got the tire wrench out and he went to work on the, the spokes and the wheels and he never rode it again. There's <laughs> no way he could. Yeah. And, and you hear all these stories about whenever you uh, damaged anything for the civilians why you had to pay for it all and we never heard anything about it. <laughs> But I guess through it all, my biggest problem now, other than the, the problem coming home, uh, no acceptance, uh, put downs, being treated like an outcast. a lot of years before I ever heard anybody say thank you and welcome home. What was the hardest part about readjusting? Well, I had this, I guess, euphoric idea that boy, when I got home, everything would be just fine. But it wasn't. Because I went from I guess a fairly fast pace uh, life. You had an important job to do and you did it and people respected you for who you were and what you did. And I got home and I was nobody. And my mom treated like me like I was still in high school. And just don't talk about that, don't want to hear about it. It's just get out there and get this ranch work done, you know. So, How do you think the Army, this 
painful experience has changed you as a person? Well, I can't. I can't quite figure out how it would have been if I would have never went there. And my sister used to always ask me what happened to me. Finally, asked her why do you keep asking me that. She said, "Well, you came home different." I said, "Well, you see things and you do things that I guess changes you." She said, "Yeah, but you're just a total different person." I says, "I don't know." It, but I've been doing the counseling with through the VA for since I think 14. I have a, I get these road rage instances. It's like something happens out on the road and I go into convoy escort mode. Some days I'm afraid they're gonna lock me up and throw away the key. I just... Is that like a flashback or is it I, just... It just, it's just, you know, somebody cuts you off or somebody an interstate hymns you in or something just and it just the switch turns on and and they say well just think of something else or, or just well when you're in that that straight you can't just think of something else you can't just turn it off no once the switch flips on you well the, let somebody else drive well then that you know, you, you, you get the, why are you driving like this? And you know, and my wife gets mad at me because, you know, but then she, <laughs> How did you handle it when that happened? How did you get control of yourself? Well, you, sometimes you come down kind of slow and other times you, you get over it pretty quick. It just depends on how severe it hits me, I guess. And they, they tried some medication and I don't know what the first one was, but I was a zombie in the second one. I called up and said, what is that junk? And well, it was generic Prozac. I never understood people that committed suicide, but I tell you what, I'm riding down the road on my motorcycle and I'm thinking, you know, I can just go right into the back of the mall just wide open and I'd do it. Well, no. Pills would be better. It wouldn't be so messy, and why ruin a perfectly good motorcycle? Well, that's not normal. So I called him up and said, I'm taking this crap anymore, right? So they said, well, you evidently can't tolerate that kind of medication, so we're going to just not try it anymore. So, and then, of course, the, the gal quit that was, I was seeing there in North Platte. Gave them two months' notice, and the VA never filled her job. <coughs> they still haven't put it up. It's been so a couple you're of years. Any follow up care. Well, I, I had a couple of times where, man, I need to call somebody, and so I called the VA, and he had me, I think, talk to a social worker, and, and they said, well, you can go over here to this place. So they wrote something down. I went over there and they says, well, you don't need to go here. You go across over here uh, to this place. So I went over there and the gal was at her computer and she's asking me questions. And she said, well, I see you used to see Jill at the VA. I said, yeah, but she quit. Well, she says, the place in Oglala where she works is part of this you know, they're combined, you know, they're the same company or whatever. She so said, would you be willing to Zoom with her? So, that's what I'm doing now. That's good. So the first session we had, I says, you thought you got rid of me, didn't you? <laughs> so how are you doing these days? No, just, I don't know. Okay, I guess. But I don't know when this 
the road rage thing really can't say really when it got to go on. I mean, you know, I'd, people do stuff, but me, I'd yell at them or something, you know, to myself in the car, but when it started getting where I was reacting to it, I don't know what triggered that. I went for years, and I, you know, you know, I'd say, "Well, you look at that idiot," you know, like that. But then it all of a sudden got doing weird stuff on the road and scaring my wife, great, you know, half to death. So I don't know. <laughs> Do you still keep in touch with some of your buddies from your unit? Yeah, uh, 20 years ago, I was a chairman for this reunion in North Platte and I sent out to some letters to some people from somebody found the last known addresses of some people and I sent out I think eight letters and no response. So I was kind of bummed out and then uh, I don't know, maybe six years ago or so just out of the blue this Sammy Gay calls me up and says, Hey, I found your letter moving a bunch of stuff around. Sorry I didn't reply to you. Said, My God, that's been years ago. So then a couple years later, he found this Purcell that you guys just interviewed and got together. And then they came three years ago to this reunion and we got to talking about this other guy we knew called, the last name was Fletcher. And we threw our memories together collectively we figured out he lived in Lynchburg Tennessee so I googled his name and there it was phone number and everything I called it his wife said hello says, Ben Fletcher there she says yeah just a minute we talked for an hour but he's got bad health he had a severe heart attack last September He's got trouble with these kidneys. I, I feel a need that maybe I should go down there and see him. You think you will? I'd like to. Because he, he graduated college and he got his draft notice that day. They were watching him pretty close. So he's older than the rest of us. The rest of us were like 19 when we went over, and he was, what, four years older, I suppose. Did you use the GI Bill when you got yes, there? Yes, I did. What did you study? I went to North Platte and took a two-year course in building construction technology. And I was a carpenter for several years, and then I hired out Union Pacific Railroad as a carman which is a mechanical inspection and maintenance of freight cars. I did that 34 and a half years and retired in 12. And Do you belong to any veteran service organizations like the American Legion or the VFW? Uh, I'm a member of the American Legion, American Legion Riders, VFW. Uh, I'm on the board uh, the 20th Century Veterans Memorial in North Platte. I'm on the North Platte Honor Guard. We do a lot of honor guards for veterans because Fort McPherson's right there south of Maxwell. Is Maxwell Air Force Base? What's that? Maxwell Air Force Base? No, it's Fort McPherson. National Cemetery. It's just south of Maxwell, which is 13 miles east of North, uh, North Platte. Is there anything about military service that you want someone else to know? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's. I guess nowadays it's, it'd be a good place with a roof over your head and whatever if that's what you want to go into, but that wasn't for me. Uh, I got out as soon as I could. Uh, 
the other two guys that were in the same boat. An ironic thing is, they both went back in and retired military, and I actually, in seven in 76, was in the local guard unit in North Platte for one year. I had a try one prior service, so I signed up for a year, but after a year I decided, no, I don't think this is for me. I didn't seem like I fit in. The, the guardsmen were still the people that joined the guard to get out of going to Vietnam, sort of. So they kind of resented it. I remember one guy, he, he says, how close to the DMZ were you? And I says, oh, way south. He says, so you weren't anywhere near the fighting? And I said, I guess not. Because Vietnam did not have a front line. Like, you know, it, it was just kind of fluid. Well, what was ours was inside the wire, the perimeter, you know, was the perimeter of your camp or your base, inside the wire, inside the bunker line was ours and everything outside of there. So like when I'd go on a convoy, as soon as I'd leave the gate, we were out in anybody's territory. And when we'd get to the at camp at the other end, when we drove inside, then we were, but any, anywhere outside the camp was anybody's territory. There was no, you know, like World War II or Korea, there was, here's the front line and then behind you're in the rear and if you're over you're in enemy territory and uh, war is like a football game you take over your opponent and acquire their territory and that's how you win but I don't know how you win when you don't do that and to me that's that's what was wrong with Vietnam I mean how did you feel day to day doing this job? Duty. Well, that was pretty tense. I, I remember a few instances at the beginning and, and in that, that one I told you about, but over the span it wasn't that long really when you look at it. All I can remember is we'd get to the destination and the, some truck driver would say, boy, I just love the way you run them gooks off the road back there at so-and-so, and I'd just say, yeah, and it's like, what are you talking about? Because it didn't, it was just normal driving to me. <laughs> so. Any road rage there? No, I, it went, uh, I guess I was in crazy mode the whole time I was driving, so it wasn't any, Normal. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But somehow it stays with me. How do you feel about your experiences having served and done all you've done? What, is, what does that make you feel like now? Well, I'm proud that I went. I did everything they asked of me, and maybe a little more. The perception of what we did from everybody back here was totally different, you know. How was that? Well, you're called crazy non-vets, baby killers, idiots. Brother-in-law, I remember he says that war I would have never went. I'd have went to Canada. I said, "Well, my draft notice didn't say on the bottom, or you can go to Canada and you'll be pardoned later." I said, "You are here by order to report." And that's what I did. So did any of your? You said you had one other sibling that served. Yes. Where did he serve? <clears throat> he he took basic. <clears throat> Excuse me, he took basic training at Fort Lewis, Washington also, and then he went to uh, Oklahoma and then Texas and trained, and he was in the 2nd Armored Cavalry, Fort Hood, Texas. And they trained him also in something called red-eye anti-aircraft missiles. 
and they didn't use that in Vietnam and they wouldn't send him there. And for some dumb reason he told me, well, he, he wanted to get out of there so he wanted to volunteer and they said, we can't send you because we've spent all this money training you in this anti-aircraft missile thing. We don't use that over there, so. So he didn't even go over to Vietnam? No. And then he got out three months early. But I blew him out of the water on that one because I got out way earlier than that. Because it was a whole turnaround from they would take anybody to where they wanted everybody out. I, I signed this waiver when I got home. I, I, one year, nine days is my total. What was the waiver? Well, it said that I only got a month and a half for every month or a part there of served for GI Bill. And that's all you got anyway. You spent two years, you got 36 months. I spent, I got credit for 19 and a half months, or, you know, for, for schooling. And I used two year, two year course, that covered it, so. Is there anything that you want people watching this video to know about you, or about the war, or about America in general? Well, I'd like to see this country get back on track. And, you know, they're after the, the Twin Towers deal. Everybody flew their flag and everybody's patriotic. Now everybody is negative country, negative military, negative everything. It's just like their heads aren't screwed on straight. It's <laughs> kind of like I was when I came home. <laughs> Things I did. The only thing I can say is my head wasn't screwed on straight. <laughs> that was from your service out there? Well, yeah. I, I guess they would say it was BTS. You didn't know, even know there was such a thing, because the VA didn't have anything that they called that. And I didn't go to the VA. I, you know, nothing wrong with me. I'm good. I'm good to go. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, it's not. Okay. Well, thank you, Robert, for sharing your story with us, and especially thank you for your service. We appreciate you. Thank you.